and threatened Sorry by young guys somehow because I threatened them because of the way I looked. I threatened them because I was wearing a dress. You figure that one out. At, at its core, I think what was happening is that they hated me and what I represented because they were terrified of the feminine within themselves. And it's still true. It is still true. Outside of the New Jersey movie theater one night, I and my friends were chased by a group of straight boys. We were called faggots. And we were told that they were going to kill us after we gave them blowjobs because they assumed that we wanted to blow them, especially because I was in drag. I had to want to blow them because I was wearing a dress. Somehow I got separated from my friends and I ended up standing surrounded by this group of boys. I pulled out mace, which I carried with me, but the thing wouldn't spray. Can you imagine? I'm standing there, I'm holding it to them, and nothing happened. Luckily, I had taken Quaker uh, Friends Nonviolence Training, and I ran out, immediately ran out to the middle of the street and started acting like a crazy person and yelling at all the cars that were going by and making a huge scene, and they all took off. It, it, by the way, it was a really great tactic for self-defense. When I talked to people about what had happened to me, guess what they said? You're bald. Well, if you hadn't been dressed like that, if I hadn't been dressed like that, it was my fault that these thugs wanted to kill me after I gave them a blowjob? It was my fault? I didn't accept that if you weren't dressed that way. I didn't accept that back then, and I don't accept it now. The sad reality of 40 years ago is that I can tell you honestly that Almost every drag queen and every transgender woman I knew had been raped at some point in their life. Had been raped at some point in their life. Raped by a family member, a John, a cop, or someone on the street. Not only raped, but many of the older queens had scars on their bodies from times they were beaten up by cops when they were arrested when the politicians wanted to clean up the streets, usually because an election was coming. I was raped by a guy I was living with. He'd been out drinking with a friend. They came in late. I was asleep on the sofa. They woke me and told me that we were going to have a threesome. I said no, but to them, no meant yes. In gay culture at the time, there was this horrible, campy saying, you can't rape the willing. You can't rape a man. I was raped. The next morning, I was in my doctor's office in South Philly, and I told the little old Italian doctor that I had been constipated, and that I had forced myself to go that morning, and that's why I was bleeding and that's why I was in such terrible pain. Queens never reported rape. We didn't report it because who would believe us? No one. No one would believe us. What would they say to us? Well, if you weren't dressed that way. These days, transgender women get murdered by men who defend themselves by using the transsexual, uh, transgender panic defense, which is similar to the homosexual panic defense. Oh, I didn't know she was transgender, and I was so outraged and upset and traumatized at discovering that she was transgender that I had to murder her. That's not a fucking defense. You don't marry somebody because you discover that they're not what you think they are? If that were the case, we'd all be murdering Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan and every fucking politician in this country. Cut me a break. But that was a defense that they used in the Gwen Araujo case right here in California. The defendant said that they murdered her 
because they didn't know. They murdered her because that's a defense for murdering a transgender woman? That's no defense. That's no defense, just like it's no defense to say he came on to me in murdering a gay man. That's no defense for murdering a gay man. He came on to me, he made a pass at me. And it's not a defense to say she was dressed like a slut when you rape or murder a woman. Not a defense. We have a right to our bodies. We have a right to dress any way we choose at any time we choose to do it. A right to be safe when we walk down the streets dressed that way. A right not to be murdered because of how we look or dress or because of who we are. It's our right. And no one, not the cops, not the bullies, not the rapists, not the fag and trans bashers, especially not the courts, are going to take that right away from us. Thank you. Tommy Abacola, you Mecca. Thank you so much, Tommy. I feel, I feel like we got to do a chant right now. How does everyone else feel about that? Feels right, okay? This is one that I feel like people are pretty comfortable knowing. If you don't, I'm pretty sure some of you do, and you'll all get it, all right? When people's bodies are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. When people's bodies are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. When people's rights are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. When people's voices are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. That's right. Just a little bit of information for everybody. There are two groups that we have here today outside of the organizers. The first group are the ones that are here to keep you safe and make sure that the space that you're in is one that you can express yourself in. Our slut wranglers, <laughs> defined by their t-shirts. Some of them I don't think are wearing t-shirts, but that's okay too. They are here to wrangle you if you need wrangling. The other group that we have here today, we actually have six uh, therapists here today, the slut shrinks. These are fantastic women that are either training to or are, are, are already an acting being expressive arts therapists. They're here uh, specifically in case anyone feels triggered at this event, in case anyone feels the need to disclose at this event. And they also have resources available for you if everyone needs uh, information about who they can reach out to at another time, okay? So now I'm going to introduce another one of my co-organizers, Mari, and Mari is going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you everyone for coming out. You guys look amazing. Um, it's very important to come out, especially here in the mission, um, where there has been many cases of women getting raped here during the summer and in the past year. So it's very important that we have it here and that we show ourselves here and we show that we are not afraid. So I'm very pleased to introduce Maxine Dugan, who is from the Erotic Service Providers Union. She's a sex worker and she works also to help other sex workers to gain labor agency through, through the uh, skills from labor unions. And it's very important that Saltwalk SF supports sex workers because we see so many, we see so many cases of slut shaming towards sex workers, towards strippers, towards porn stars, towards sex workers, towards working prostitutes, male and female. And I want to read you something that British journalist Laurie Penny wrote in her book, Meat Market, Female Fle Flesh Under Late Capitalism. If you have a chance, please go to our feminist literature table, where we have books from uh, fiction to nonfiction, young adult to classics, from people like Virginia Woolf, Simone de Beauvoir, to contemporary feminists like Jessica Valenti. Right now, I, I will read you uh, an excerpt from contemporary feminist Laurie Penny. The contemporary feminist conversation about sex work is a sea of unheard voices, private tragedy, and misinformation in which more squabbling obscures the real life concerns of many vulnerable women and men. The net result of continued ideological language 
interacting between feminist, sex workers, rights activists, and misogynist lawmakers has left the legal status of sex work in Britain and America an unworkable, precarious Jenga tower of muddled laws and moral equivocation. When women who work as prostitutes are stranded in a socioeconomic no man's land, they work just about legal enough to offer a seedy but acceptable outlet for restrained bourgeois sexual mores and an economic option for women in desperate financial circumstances and just about illegal enough that the market for commercial sex remains illicit and underground, depriving sex workers of public dignity and of the full protection of the justice system and satisfying the prudish public drive to punish those who sell sex. It is my pleasure and Saltwalk SF's pleasure to introduce to you Maxine Dugan. Um, my name is Maxine Dugan and I am the founder of the Erotic Service Providers Union. Um, <laughs> The Erotic Service Providers Union is for anybody who earns a living from their erotic labor. Um, you could be a exotic dancer, you can be a phone sex operator, you could be a dominatrix or a professional submissive, you can be an adult film performer, um, you could be a webcam performer, which is the fastest growing part of the sex industry right now. So do we have any actual erotic service providers in the crowd who can self-identify? Yeah. Well, thank you, Setwalk, for having us here. I myself work as a prostitute of 22 years, and hopefully I'll get to work as a prostitute for another 22 more. I really want to appreciate the Slut Walk organizers uh, for all the hard work that they do today to bring visibility to this very important issue um, because uh, being sexually assaulted on your job or if you're not on your job is, is a bad thing and we all need to have equal protection under the law. Um, and the sexual expression in any form that we might take it, um, you know, needs to be protected in the public sphere and that's why it's really important to come publicly out and stand for freedom of sexual expression. You know, I have to say that I'm more than disappointed in the uh, response from the neoliberal press um, who jumped to defend the law student Sandra Fluke for being called a slut, but uh, they didn't defend her for being called a prostitute by, by Rush Limbaugh. Um, his, um, you know, his uh, view was that, you know, any sex that she has, uh, um, you know, any sex that any of us have, that it, we engage in either paid or unpaid, is part of the political domain. That we're a part of the political public culture. That our bodies are still public property. And that they can do whatever they want to us whenever they want. And that's not right. And in the eyes of the hysterical, indignant female pundits um, who said that sluts, you know, are defensible, but yet, you know, paid sex acts or people who provide paid sex acts like me or like you are not, then that's a form of horizontal uh, uh, hostility. It's a form of horizontal discrimination, and it's a way that, you know, people engage in oppressing us, and, and that's not right. Because sluts and prostitutes, you know, are viewed as part of being a part of the public domain. They think that they can do whatever they want to our bodies, and they can change whatever laws they want regarding our activities whenever they want, because they think they have our best interest at heart, and they don't. Right now, the prostitution laws um, say that I can't negotiate for my own labor and my own safe work conditions that using a condom on my job uh, is a means upon which evidence is gathered that I've had sex or intend to have sex and is used as evidence uh, that I've committed the crime of prostitution and that's not right. You know, Absolutely. right now under the criminalization of prostitution laws, I don't have access to equal protection under the law that no erotic service providers 
you know, who are victim of rape, robbery, theft, coercion, or extortion can go to the police and say, hey, I've been a victim of a crime without the threat of being investigated or arrested for prostitution. And that's not right. You don't even have to be an actual working prostitute for the police to suspect that you're a prostitute and deny you this equal protection under the law because of what you're wearing or because of what corner street you're standing on or because of who you might be standing with. And that's not right. <laughs> Currently in California, these extremist forces have banded together against us to further criminalize our freedom of expression under a ballot measure called Prop 35. Prop 35 is a bait-and-switch ballot measure that broadens the definition of who is a human trafficker to include all of our intimate, our domestic, and our um, economic relationships to now be called human traffickers and to be forced to register as sex offenders. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, you know, if Joan Jett were starting her first ban today, you know, in the U.S., she'd have to call them the traffic victims instead of the runaways because they use all this traffic victim rhetoric as a means to further criminalize sexual expression and deny us equal um, access to equal protection, and that's not right. <clears throat> Pro uh, Prop 35 institutionalizes, it further institutionalizes the rape culture by denying us access to equal protection under the law. Uh, Pro you know, Prop 35 wants to um, further institutionalize the rape culture, um, you know, uh, as the excuse of rescuing traffic victims, that we have to be arrested first. Oh no, first they have to have sex with us first while in the, they're in the course of arresting us, right? The police get to have sexual contact with us all under the guise of um, abating uh, human trafficking. That that kind of sexual contact is legal in California because it's legal under the entrapment laws. So they get to have sex with us under these anti-prostitution laws and then they get to arrest us. And it doesn't even matter if we're human traffic victims or not. We all end up in jail. We all end up with criminal cases. And we all get trafficked to jail. And that's not right. <laughs> What's really egregious in Prop 35 to me and should be to you is that Prop 35 broadens the definition of who, who is a human trafficker and says that even if you don't touch anybody sexually, you can be convicted of human trafficking and forced to register as a sex offender and spend more time in jail than somebody who has actually committed the crime of rape. And that's not right. It completely diminishes the crime of rape and it completely diminishes the suffering of rape victims and that is not right and we should tell these people in prop 35 that if they really cared about us they should have come to us and talked to us first so that they could have included us in equal protection under the law and they didn't do that they didn't do that because they don't really care about us they don't care about people who are walking down the street dressed a certain way or standing on a certain certain street corner who might be caught in a prostitution sting operation. That's why it's important for us to be here today to stand in solidarity with each other, to stand up and say that rape is rape, no means no, yes means yes, and that nobody has the right to put their hands on us without their permission, without our permission, that they can't change the conditions under which we are having sexual contact with them in the middle of the sex act. It's not okay to say, oh, by the way, I'm a cop and flash a badge and you get to give me a blowjob now and then I'm going to arrest you and take you to jail. That is a form of sexual assault and that has to be stopped by repealing the criminalization of the prostitution laws. That has to be stopped by getting equal protection under the law so that all erotic service providers have equal protection to be able to stand up and say, 
I'm a victim and my crime and my perpetrator needs to be convicted as such and that has to be upheld. We have to stand for that. We have to demand it because they're not going to give it to us if we don't stand up and draw that line in the sand and tell them enough is enough. Send your Prop 35 back to the drawing board and demand that we come to the table to speak about what equal, per, equal protection under the law looks like. My name is Maxine Dujin. I'm an erotic service provider. My table is over here. I would love to speak to you all. Thank you all for coming. Yes, indeed. Register to vote, Carol Queen said. Very, very true. All right, so we have three more speakers before we march. And uh, again, Evelyn is going to be coming to introduce our next speaker. Evelyn, darling. Evelyn, Evelyn, Evelyn. 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 Anyone? Evelyn. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on. We're going to move on to the next speaker, which is really exciting. Um, before we do that, there's actually a, um, today in solidarity, uh, one of my friends sent me something that I think is pretty spectacular and actually are really good and valid points about rape prevention that I just wanted to share with everyone in case you want to kind of take it out and use it as a little bit of a way to, to stay safe yourself. First of all, when you see a woman walking by herself, don't rape her. If you are in an elevator and a woman gets on the elevator with you, don't rape her. When you encounter a person who is asleep, the safest course of action is not to rape her. Remember, people go into the laundry room to do their laundry. Do not attempt to rape someone who is alone in the laundry room. Use the buddy system. If it is inconvenient for you to stop yourself from raping people, ask a trusted friend to accompany you at all times. <laughs> Carry a rape whistle. If you find that you are about to rape someone, blow the whistle until someone comes to stop you. And lastly, don't forget, honesty is the best policy. When asking a person out on a date, don't pretend that you're interested in them as a person. Tell them straight up that you expect to be raping them later. If you don't communicate your intention, the person might take it as a sign that you do not plan to rape him, her, or them. I would like to see a little bit more of this kind of list in our safety forums, and I'm sure you all agree. So our next speaker I'm very excited about. Uh, our next speaker is Natalie Rizzi. She is here speaking from Women Organized to Resist and Defend. Yes, Women Organized to Resist and Defend. Uh, this is a grassroots organization that just started recently uh, that is here to, in response, direct response to all of the things that have been happening lately that have been challenging equality for women in our current legislation in America. Very excited about this. Here is Natalie. But on Wednesday, during a sentencing hearing for a sexual assault, a judge in Arizona, Judge Hatch, told the victim that if she just hadn't been in the bar, that wouldn't have happened to her. Right? And Judge Hatch this weekend was forced to issue an apology for that comment in her court. But the comment was actually larger. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a little sick. Um, she also said that women shouldn't go grocery shopping after 10 p.m. at night because it's too dangerous. That is the kind of world we live in. Well, a woman is groped by an off-duty police officer in a bar and then told by the authority she went to for some sort of response to this crime that it was her fault. She shouldn't have gone to the bar. And then the authority continues to say, recognizing her own vulnerability as a woman, that all women just have to be safer. If you go to the grocery store at night, you might get hurt because you are a woman. That is what we're here for here today. We're here today to say that as women, 
we should be able to go to the grocery store at 10 p.m. at night. We should be able to go to the grocery store at 3 o'clock in the morning and feel safe. We should not be told by the judges and the cops and the safety officers that it was our fault we were assaulted by a man. Right now, women in this country, and really around the world, but I want to talk about this country for a second. Because there's a lot of speaking that happens about how, how privileged we are in this country. But in reality, we are facing a crisis for women in this country. The, mo the most recent congressional session has introduced 55 anti-women bills. In not even a year. Last year it was twice that number. We have seen the biggest attack on reproductive rights in decades in the last two years. But it doesn't stop there. We make 78 cents to the dollar for every white man. And if we are Latina or African American, it's 20 cents lower. We work the hardest and we make the least. We are the poorest. We are affected the most by the budget cuts. So, Word is really excited to see you here today. Congratulations on coming out today to stand up for women's rights. <laughs> Two weeks ago, there was another demonstration here in the mission, where we also had hundreds of people come out to stand up for women's rights. And we think this is the beginning of what could be a new women's movement. This is our time. We need to look at our history. Look at when Roe v. Wade was passed. Look at who was on the court that passed Roe v. Wade, that made that decision. It was all wealthy white men. They didn't kind of decide, oh, now I think, I think we care about all those women who are performing back alley abortions or using hangers when they could have access to safe, comprehensive health care. They didn't decide to care. We forced them to care. The women, our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers have made every change for us possible, ever. From voting to Roe v. Wade to stopping violence to stopping the commercialization of our bodies. When our women's movement allied with all the other movements in the 60s and 70s was strong, Rush Limbaugh wouldn't have said what he could say now about Sandra Fluke. Ta uh, Republican Aiken wouldn't have said what he said, that women's bodies have some way to stop pregnancy when they get raped, as if he has any idea what that means or what it means to be raped. So word, Women Organized to Resist and Defend is out as much as we can. We are out on the streets. We're going to be out on October 16th to 22nd when the Dem Democrats and Republicans are having their debates about who knows what, because they never talk about our issues. They never talk about what it really means for us as women or as working people, as single mothers, what it really means to make real change for us. So we'll be out in the streets that week. We hope you can join us. And we also have a petition right now to stop, to ask Aiken to, not ask, to force. Force Aiken to resign from the race because no one should ever feel like they can speak about women, about the LGBT community, about immigrants, about all of us, the way the Republicans speak about us right now. <laughs> but more than that, we're not just satisfied with forcing the Republicans to recant what they say. The Democrats have never stood up for us when they needed to. So we are putting out a pledge. It is one line. It can be taken to Republicans and Democrats and will say, you sign this, you promise never to vote for any legislation against a woman, her body, her right to control her body, her right to choose, her right to feel safe, her right to be who she is. And we're asking all of you to take that pledge with us, October 16th to 22nd, go to those politicians and do what our ancestors have done now for hundreds of years. Build a movement. It doesn't matter who's in the Congress or who's in the White House or who's on, sitting in the judge's seat, but it's about us. It's about us 
building a movement that says no more. And I'd like to end with a chant, if my throat can keep taking it. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. Oh, come on, you guys can do this so much louder. You are here fighting for women's rights. Stand up, stand up, come on. Do it. Get up. We're not going to sit down and fight for our rights. We are going to stand up and fight for our rights. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. No means no, and nothing less. The way we dress does not mean yes. Thank you, and join word that we excited about women organize or resist and defend oh my god yeah also by the way just to mention it tomorrow women organize to resist and defend word is having a community meeting at two o'clock please show up and show your support and get involved if you 2969 mission all right i'm happy that you're standing and excited we have two more speakers so if you want to sit down that's okay too i will not judge you and now i really am going to introduce evelyn again who's going to introduce our next speaker Hi again. Our next speaker is uh, one of my favorite people in the world. She is a badass when it comes to academia and as a director of the Women's Center at San Francisco State, as an immigrant, as a woman of color, I can't speak of her highly enough. She is amazing in whatever she does. So she's here to talk to you about just empowering yourself and going out there and looking for your freedom. Um, whatever's holding you back, kick it down and find who you are. Uh, her name is Perla, and she is going to come and talk to you right now. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Um, I was supposed to do this speech in Spanish, but now I'm kind of just improvising. Um, so my name is Perla. I'm actually the director of the Women's Center at San Francisco State University. Uh, I've been in that position for about a year now, and I urge everybody to, you know, please come and uh, see us. It's a safe place for all women, uh, regardless of, you know, sexual orientation and background. Uh, it's a safe space for anybody that just wants to come and hang out. Uh, we're always, you know, happy to see you, and uh, we're also, you know, willing to help out in any way we can. Uh, we are uh, having our second women's conference in March 9th. Um, it's it's called Breaking Boundaries, and I hope to see you all there. Um, but you know, something that uh, Evelyn, actually she took me by surprise uh, when she asked me to do this, but I, I guess, you know, I, I've always, ever since I was six years old, I kind of knew I was a feminist, but I didn't know what that meant. Like, it was like, oh, I don't want to do the dishes. Why did my brothers have to, like, they don't have to do it, but I have to do it. That's kind of fucked up, but nobody really, you know, told me what that meant. Um, and uh, I grew up in Mexico um, till I was eight years old. And then I came to the U.S. through the border um, without papers. And, you know, I, I consider myself undocumented. Um, now I'm not, uh, but because of all the barriers, you know, that are happening, a lot of my friends are still undocumented. And I have a lot of undocumented um, women friends that work really, really hard in what they do. And um, it's possible, you know, to, to, to move forward with your life. and regardless of what kind of survivor you are, you know, because I think that I can be a, a I'm an immigrant, uh, a broken system immigrant survivor, I would say. Um, you know, we're, we're a lot of different kinds of survivors in our lives, and um, I guess what I wanted to say was that it's true, nobody has the right to, to your body, to, you know, without consent. I remember my mom, you know, 30 years she stayed with um, an abusive partner because she thought that was the, r the right thing to do and she had no options to stay with him or not because of the papers, because she had no agency. There was like no way that she could leave um, my father because of that. And 
you know, I, I'm here and I truly believe that nobody should stay in a, a situation like that ever for any reason. And that there's community out there for you to, to go to. And, um, and that regardless of whether you're married, uh, that doesn't mean that it's consensual all the time, uh, you know, because you're married and that doesn't give uh, the partner the right to just claim your body whenever they want. Um, I, I firmly believe that and um, I just, you know, I, I really believe that as, as a woman of color, it's much more, uh, it's a little bit different um, to, to come out and say, you know, what we, what we need especially as an immigrant woman, where, you know, healthcare is not even um, there for us. Um, so many things, you know, are still so, um, there's so much that needs to be done for everybody to have a uh, equal, equal rights to everything, pretty much. Um, needless to say, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to fight for them, but we are, here we are. Um, so yeah, I, um, I went to university without uh, papers, and I believe anybody can do it, uh, no matter what, um, I, but you know, I've always, I never really thought about what it meant uh, without the academic, like, uh, right, like, I guess, speech, you know, that university gives you the agency to really think about uh, what's going on in, in your surroundings and why you're not, you don't feel safe. Um, and I didn't really think about it until I had, you know, educate, like academic education and, and I said, why is it that I can't? walk around the street like at midnight by myself which i which i really did a lot because when you're studying you have to be out you have to be at the library and you don't want to feel like you're you're scared and, and vulnerable when you're just trying to get home to sleep and you know jump right back in the morning and study again so that was uh, something that i just thought it was so unfair um for society to think that that was okay for me to feel unsafe and you know, it's 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 something that I, I have committed myself to. If I see something happening, to commit myself to do something about it and not just walk the other way if somebody else is being attacked. And I guess that's something that I uh, hope that you all commit with me too. Who who who's with me? Yeah. <laughs> so I just you know please. Um, I feel like I've seen it so many times. You know, everybody just, it's its none of my business, but it is, it is all of our business. It's, it is our business to make sure everybody's safe all the time. And, you know, to please, uh, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable um, be going out there and saying that they are, they feel unsafe, to, you know, just be their support for them until they're ready. My mother was not ready until 30 years after, you know, the, the abuse started. And, but I, I truly believe that anybody can uh, come out and you know empower themselves. Now she dances all the time. She goes out more than me. She's like 54, and she's like, oh well, I'm 15 now. I'm 15 again. I get to go out and party, um, you know, which I love. And I want every single woman to be happy just like her, and to to feel like they can just go out and and have agency in their lives. So. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We came to me at SF State Living Center. Thanks. How are you guys feeling? Yeah. Uh, we have one more really incredible speaker before we start to march. Are you ready to march? Yes. 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 Okay. So this speaker has so many accolades and has done so many important things, I actually had to write them down so that I can read them for you. Our next speaker is Sally Lieber, who uh, is part of the Democratic California, uh, she's a Democratic California Assemblywoman. Uh, she was the first woman to hold this position of Speaker Pro Tempore in 2007, and she's also a candidate for California's 13th State Senate District. This woman has done some really amazing things for this state. She has authored legislation that has uh, been against human trafficking. She has forced local governments to analyze rape kits that have been backed up for thousands and thousands of rape kits. Many serial perpetrators never actually being uh, caught when they could have been. Law, and she also has made law enforcement notify survivors before they throw away the evidence from their cases of sexual assault and rape. This is a really incredible woman. We're honored to have her speak with us, Sally Lieber. So um, this is a little bit of Where's Waldo today because I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm the only state legislator in Dolores Park. 
possibly at this time, <laughs> definitely at the slut walk. Um, but this has been a really special opportunity for me, and I feel like by listening to the other speakers, I've actually learned a lot today. And I have been informed by the things that they've said, I've been touched by the things that they've said, and I'm touched by the fact and informed by the presence of everybody who is here today. It is so important that you come out to be a part of this movement, to be the movement in yourself. And I was uh, so pleased to hear uh, Gwen Arajo's uh, name raised here today. I, I authored the uh, Gwen Arajo Justice for Victims Act. And so Gwen's name has a permanent place in the state law in California. And, you know, in my, in my home tradition, uh, we, we say, may her, her memory be a blessing. But I feel like we have to deserve blessings. And the way that we would deserve Gwen's blessing is by being people who stand up, who speak out, who are authentically who we are in every space. And that's how we would deserve Gwen's blessing. And that's exactly the construct that so many people in politics today, especially the commentators, but also, embarrassingly, the lawmakers are say, and the judges are saying are sluts. So I stand before you as a slut. I hope to become more of a slut. <laughs> I, I, I know that you're all sluts. I, ho I hope you still are, and I hope I still am when I'm 80 years old, when I'm 100 years old, when I'm 120 years old. I hope I become more and more of myself over time. And, you know, as I was uh, listening to all the speakers, I was looking at this beautiful bell here behind us, and it occurred to me that it's most likely a mission bell, that the people who called for it to be made were probably bought in at a very intense level to the most abusive hierarchical system that we can possibly imagine. But the person who made the bell was probably an indigenous person. And the beauty of what they made lives on here for us to look at. So I want to challenge you in two ways. Number one, every time you hear a bell, whether it's the ringer on your phone or the timer on the microwave, think about, I'm free and you're free too. Whoever the you is, whether it's the politicians who need to be free to change their evil ways, <laughs> or, or the worst person who's, who's against a movement, I think we need to think, I'm free and you're free too. We are all free to change and to move in the direction of more freedom. And the second thing that I want to challenge you to do is to, if you can, to register and to vote. Yeah! If you can vote, you're voting for other people who can't vote. There's a lot of people who are undocumented and they can't vote. They can be great activists, but they can't vote. So if you register, you're not just voting for yourself, you're voting for a whole lot of people who share your ideals. And this is a key, critical time to do this. There could not be a more important political year than 2012. And the deadline is coming up to register to vote. So it's going to seem um, geeky or whatever, but when you get together with friends, bring a, bring a bunch of voter reg forms and say, hey, who here isn't registered yet? And then get people together over coffee to sit down with the ballot and to look all the way down the ballot. And don't just let the judges for superior court be names that are on the ballot, but say, who are these people? Have they signed words pledge? Are they the kind of people that we want to have on the court? And really go into that in an intensive way. Because when this election goes by, the decision is going to be made. And it's going to be made by people who hold our values or who don't hold our values. So this is a, a, a key thing that we can do this year. 
Um, so in, in closing, I just want to say thank you. I'm so proud of everybody here. It's going to do my heart great to see everybody marching and representing in a really, really strong way. These are our lives. This is our time. We are who we are, and we have a, a right to bring who we are and what we believe in into the political system, into the streets of San Francisco, into school classrooms, into every venue uh, throughout our country. And so I want to say thank you to the organizers, um, to his, everyone who has put heart and soul into being here today, to the police officers who I saw them stop traffic so a man could get his cart across the street. And uh, I, I know that they're going to prevent us from getting run down by, by some hostile people uh, as we march. But these are the things that are really, really important to our lives. And we're lucky because we have a chance right now. And you're taking that chance. So thank you for doing that. All right, everybody. So now as we prepare to march, just a couple of quick announcements. So the march route is going to be right down Dolores. And for this part of the march, we need to stay on the sidewalk, all right? We're going to turn left on the 18th when we can start going with the flow of tra traffic in the traffic lane. And then we'll turn right on Castro and march down to Jane Warner Plaza. Mind your slut wranglers. They will be flanking the march, in back of the march, and in front of the march, leading you where to go, all right? So this, this is a picture of me. This is a picture of me when I was five years old. This is a picture of me the first time I was sexually assaulted. As we're getting ready to march, as we're marching together, take a moment to think about your own stories of sexual assault. Think about the first time that you were objectified. Think about the first time that you felt powerless in the face of a violation. And then look around you. You are surrounded by other people that have experienced the same thing that you have experienced. You are surrounded by allies that are ready to lift their voices with you to call for an end to the senseless violence that happens minute by minute over and over again as we speak in this march to the women, to the men, to the children, to the adults of this country and this world. As we march today, we are marching to say any culture in which rape or sexual violence exists in any degree of frequency is simply not good enough. We are marching today to claim ownership of our rights to express our individual sexuality whatever that might look like, and to say, if you object to it, it's none of your damn business. <laughs> and we are marching today to say that we will not be shamed, blamed, objectified, or discriminated against, and made to be silent. We will open our mouths, we will stand together, we will organize and take action for this movement. Is everybody ready to march? Yeah. Let's start it with a chant, shall we? Shatter the silence, stop the violence. 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 Shatter the silence. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to go on the. I'm not going on the march today. I have other other activities I have planned for myself in preparation for my trip to New York City. But uh, I was able to bring you a, at least an hour, hour and a half worth of uh, coverage here for the Slut Walk. So. Uh, 
Yeah. I'll be signing off here in just a minute. Uh, this is Raven Sullivan here. Uh, my next uh, live stream will be. Mm, I probably well, you know, I'm probably not going to be doing anything until I get back from to Washington D.C. But do follow me, and uh, I'll be here to uh, provide you with the latest in uh, events that are dealing with social activism and change. And this is Freeman Sullivan signing off. Thanks for watching, and do keep up.